Thank you all for coming tonight, braving the weather. Um, I just appreciate all of you coming here and for First Baptist to allow me to use this facility. Um, and tonight I want to introduce you to a woman named Florence Price. Um, I have lived with her for about two years, um, studying about her and learning and playing her music. So I just want to share you with you my love for her as well. So women have played a part in each period of music history, from one of the earliest of Hildegard of Bingen to Barbara Strozzi, Maria Szymanowski, Fanny Hensel, Cecil, Cecile Chaminade, Amy Beach, to women of today, such as Chen Yi, Mabel Bailey, Dr. Andrea Ramsey. While these women composers have had significant compositional output, there remains a large disparity between the number of times their music is included on recital programs and their male counterparts. One woman fought to break through those gender bias and racial barriers. Florence Price came at a time when seeing a female as an educator, performer, and composer was not commonplace, but being an African American was almost unheard of. As she wrote in her letter to Sergei Kuzvitsky, asking him to examine her scores, I have two handicaps, those of sex and race. I am a woman and I have Negro blood in my veins. And you will understand some of those difficulties that confront one in such a position. Please judge my music on its own merit. Florence Price strove both to overcome these in her life. Her contributions to piano pedagogy and music composition span all levels especially in piano literature, from the earliest student in her little pieces on black keys to the advanced piece that I'm playing tonight, Sonata in E minor for the piano. The music of Florence Price deserves a place in history, but is it worthy to be published and be heard on programs today along with other composers of her time? Florence Price was born in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1887. Her mother, Florence Smith, was a singer, pianist, businesswoman. Her father, Dr. James Smith, was a dentist and community activist. Her mother was her first piano teacher, and she gave her first recital at the age of four. Florence showed prodigy-like abilities at a young age. Florence's mother was always wanted the best for her daughter. She encouraged her musical skills as well as her general education. Her mother also tried to shelter her from the atrocities often inflicted on people of color. Florence graduated from high school at the age of 14 as valedictorian. At the age of 15, she was accepted into the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. She had initially wanted to pursue her career in medicine, but this would have been daunting for a black female of her day. She decided to forego that dream and enter the world of music composition. She sold her first composition to a publisher at the age of 11, but after an investigation, it is not revealed what that piece was. Sadly, this fact is true about many of her compositions. In the early 20th century, music composition was primarily a male-dominated field. When Florence completed high school in 1902, only three American women composers had succeeded in having their large-scale classical works performed by major orchestra. Those were M Margaret Long, Helen Hope Kirk, Amy Cheney Beach, and it is not known if Florence had heard of any of these women or their music. She may not have known she would break down gender barriers, but also racial barriers. When Florence entered the New England Conservatory, she was one of many women granted admittance. However, many considered the conservatory a finishing school for women to make her independent and self-supporting, more intellectual and refined, an ornament of society, a pleasure to family and friends. To her, this was not the case. Florence attended her first year of college at the New England Conservatory at the age of 16. She enrolled in two majors, one in organ and one in piano. In Boston, is reported that many African-American women were involved in some type of music. She took advantage of every opportunity afforded to a young aspiring musician, and she wanted to excel. She chose a double degree program in organ performance and what is today known as piano pedagogy at the school. She studied a litany of grueling courses, ear training, dictation, harmony, organ construction, history of organ literature, counterpoint, music history, orchestral score reading, and among other subjects. The normal program was a program that Price studied, which would provide training for music teachers and music education. Price focused in areas of teaching and organ performance. In addition to these programs, she furthered her studies in composition and studied with George Chadwick. He would help Price develop her style and truly learn to develop the basis of her music on Negro folk melodies. 
in which he also showed an interest. Both composers sought to develop uniquely American melodies and stray away from German influences. Chadwick treated women equally in his studio as he treated men. Under his tutelage, Price embraced the African-American folk music that her people often shunned. It became a part of her as a composer, and she embraced it. After graduating from the conservatory, Florence moved back to Little Rock to teach at Shorter College. Teaching jobs for black women in North were hard to find. She likely returned home to help further the community she grew up in and aid in the um, education of blacks in the South. There was a growing demand for black teachers at every level of education. During this time, her father had passed away and her mother moved from Arkansas. She saw this as an opportunity to spread her wings and seek a new future. She would go on to later accept a teaching position at Clark University in Atlanta, Georgia. While at Clark, Florence gave regular organ and piano recitals and brought in artists of color for the university. These performances allowed students to experience culture and see, for them, see themselves performing and doing what they loved. She was an in-demand teacher. She also started composing music for students at this time. She once applied to become a member of the Arkansas Music Teachers Association, but she was sadly denied. However, she would start a club for African-American teachers. As she pursued composition, she pursued a publisher as well. This task proved to be very difficult. She had reached out to one publisher called Smits, but only found out that 12% of their catalog was, um, contained 12% of women um, composers. After Clark, she returned to Arkansas, only eventually to move on to Chicago, to move away from the growing Jim Crow South. She continued to teach piano and organ as well, and she played incidental music for silent movies. Chicago is where her composing flourished. Once she moved to Chicago, however, the scale of Price's work grew in tandem with the opportunities she encountered. She was able to surround herself with people and present her music. Although many music clubs were not open to people of color, they established their own music clubs. She was a part of the National Association of Negro Musicians. They had their salons in which they performed for each other. And in time, the poetry, art, and dance, and music they created and nurtured migrated beyond the walls of these homes, and they entered mainstream America's consciousness and radically redefined the expressive culture. Many of these homes drew from the 19th century European salon culture and thus fostered new definitions for what and for whom such creative spaces could represent. 1932 became a pivotal year for Florence Price. She submitted some, several of her compositions to the Wanamaker Foundation, which is a philanthropic foundation for black composers. Florence became friends with the Bonds family and their daughter Margaret, who was one of her students. It was this friendship that helped her work and um, uplift her and helped her grow spiritually. Florence Price go on to, went on to win for her piano sonata and her symphony. The Wanamaker triumphs had a transformative effect on her finances since the $750 in prizes helped alleviate her immediate monetary concerns and on her professional standing. Since the symphony led directly to a new stature as one of the nation's most important composers and on her uh, psychological state since the time with the Bonds family provided her with a cocoon in which she could continue to leave behind the title of Mrs. Thomas J. Price and work the various stages of her metamorphosis. The Wanamaker helped her and rec helped her be recognized for her dearly loved craft. Price composed over 300 pieces in her lifetime. Some of her music was finally being published. She wrote more strictly piano music than Gershwin did and her efforts are no less distinctive. In 1933, the Chicago Symphony performed her symphony in E minor. Her music caught the attention of Marian Anderson, Eleanor Roosevelt, and many others. She would emerge as one of Chicago's most celebrated black composers. But why is Florence important to piano pedagogy? Several factors indicate this. In addition to her impressive abilities as a composer of large scale works, she had a natural gift and propensity toward teaching. Her teacher's diploma from the New England Conservatory, newspaper reports, and numerous teaching pieces she composed led to this fact. Price's music was gaining a new life, with people rediscovering her. What is often looked as her wealth of teaching pieces. Price's long successful te teaching career in both in the private studio and compositions highlight the main theme, um, sorry, 
her collegiate capacity began in 1906. Her teaching career and numerous pedagogical compositions highlight the main theme of the Harlem Renaissance, which was education as a means of uplifting societal views of African Americans. Yes, her music is played by great musicians and pianists alike, but there's music for every level of piano. She was a piano and music teacher for most of her life. She composed great works as well as music for everyone. Maybe some of her music was written out of necessity due to the number of students she taught in her career. According to Ray Linda Brown, who's the, her biographer, Price became one of Black Little Rock's most sought after teachers with the reputation for giving her students solid backgrounds in piano technique, music theory, including regularly transposing music, Rather than relying solely on piano method books of others, she wrote her own studies at the beginning, intermediate, and advanced levels, each emphasizing a different aspect of piano. Method books may not have been financially feasible for many of her students, so she created pieces for them. Her training is evident in her understanding of keyboard geography and the mechanics of piano playing. She created some beautiful pieces for younger students. Her music was never organized into a method. Her pedagogical compositions were regularly published, and some of these were included in the Oxford Normal Course for Teachers. But thanks to Leah Jensen, she created and organized some of Price's early teaching pieces into a volume um, available for teachers to use to introduce a composer who had almost been forgotten. Jensen Abbott explains, as someone who studies pedagogy, I see Florence as a very forward-looking um, teacher in how she breaks down concepts and is aware of the physicality of the piano and the physiology of the hand. These are not considerations you see in pedagogies developed by many prominent teachers and performers historically. Look at the catalog of her piano music. You can see a progression of her works that would make great supplements or even substitutes for works that have been traditionally played for years. Introducing new music to our students and expanding their knowledge outside the Western canon is vital. I've introduced you to her music at, so I have introduced her music to several students at different levels of, in my own studio. I've used her black key pieces for my beginner students and they've even performed those in festivals. Price didn't give these pieces title, so it allowed creativity for my students to create their own titles and how they would like to play the piece. Her music is a snapshot of her life and reflects her past. She uses it often to create a mood or a picture of what she hopes to convey with her music. Her early works include such titles as Clover, Clover, Ball, Clover Blossom, The Gnat and the Mosquito, The Sea Swallow, Froggy and the Rabbit, Cotton Dance, Bright Eyes, Tickling Toes, The Old Boatman, Levy Dance, and many others with these colorful titles. In addition to these elementary pieces, she wrote intermediate pieces as well, such as Preludes, Song Without Words, and Impromptus. Each one of these pieces have a t place in today's piano literature, from the very beginning to the very be advanced. One of her pieces may spark a student's interest in someone new and see themselves in her and her struggle. Parents whose children balk at practicing piano may want to buy one of her beginner pieces and say to their children, let me tell you a story of a woman who did not let adversity stop her from writing this lesson for kids just like you. Tonight I'm playing pian the Price's um, Piano Sonata in E minor. This provides a large-scale piano work by an African-American composer for pianists to play. Price herself performed this piece at many Chicago recitals as well as um, she was able to play it in Arkansas. When hearing it, you may wonder, what noted composer wrote this? Is it Schumann, Chopin, Rachmaninoff, or Gershwin? The Sonata in E minor is an excellent example of Price's style of romanticism with true African-American idioms and spirituals. Price understood and embraced her culture and celebrated it in this work. Kim Nagy said in her 1995 Clever article, the player should have complete technical mastery of the piano. The piece includes frequent parallel octaves in the left hand, large chords, extensions of the interval of a tenth, polyrhythms. Some believe this is her only virtuosic work for piano. Linda Holzer writes, Price's Sonata in E minor is unique for the solo piano repertoire of its time, and that is the synthesis of the elements of Negro folk music with the elements of 19th century virtuoso romanticism within sonata form. This sonata work presents this material in a structurally innovative fashion. She composes this in seemingly desperate mediums and fuses them by borrowing from other generic sources, namely the piano concerto, vocal music, and symphonic genres. 
In this sonata, one will find episodes not explainable in traditional sonata form language. Instead, Price liberates certain sonata expectations and gives her music a greater lyrical, harmonic, and textual freedom by interspersing cadenza episodes throughout three movements. It is a three-movement sonata with conservative harmony and structure in the Romantic tradition. The first movement is an andante allegro, which follows closely the classical design with a slow movement introduction with stately chords and dotted rhythms. The first theme in E minor is a confident and uplifting spiritual-like theme with a transition that um, leads to a threefold statement of a lyrical second theme in C major. Both themes are aptly treated in the development and recapitulations, sometimes accompanied by straightforward harmonies and sometimes with more nebulous, modulating sequences. Price's middle movement is perhaps the gem of the entire sonata. In terms of expressive depth, set in rondo form, Price perhaps borrows from the tradition of Beethoven's Pathétique Sonata in Opus 13 for its formal structure. Inside this rondo form is a wealth of motivic um, unity and lyrical beauty. Price's love of romantic music is evident in this movement. With themes reminiscent of Chopin and Schumann, Price composed a lyrical, spiritual-like theme with her characteristic syncopated rhythms, um, capturing some of the African-American singing culture by repeating her tunes several times, but with varied harmonies. In other words, the cultural emphasis on lyricism is reconciled here with subtle harmonic changes to keep momentum, but at the same time, lavishing in the beauty of the time. But the lyrical beauty is only one expressive dimension. Price underscores her beautiful melodies with harmonic ingenuity and structural organicism. The final movement is a virtuosic scherzo allegro. This piece is Price's only piano sonata believed to exist and was published well after her death actually in 1997 when it was when this piece was finally published. It is a technically challenging movement divided into two sections. The central theme is a descending triplet based on E minor scale, which gives way to a lyrical cantabile before it returns to the um, first half of the movement. The second section is based on a syncopated dance rhythms, again, expressing her African-American roots. It ends with a tour de force dance theme and secondary themes are taken throughout a series of meter and tempo changes to bring it to a triumphant close. Florence Price died from a stroke in 1953. Her unexpected death occurred as she was getting ready to go on her first European tour, which she was never able to do. Sadly, her music died with her. Um, her music was no longer being heard on programs. Then on a fateful day in 2009, a substantial cache of Price's manuscripts were found in a dilapidated house in St. Anne, Illinois. This house was reported to be her summer home. The couple who discovered these papers reached out to the University of Arkansas, which already um, had um, some of her memorabilia, and donated all of this um, wealth of music. In addition to Sher uh, Shermer Music Company purchased her music catalog. If it had not been for these people, today, um, people today may not remember Florence Price. Florence never gave up on fulfilling and working for her dream of having music performed or published. Fulfillment may not have been immediate, but she worked hard to perfect her craft. Her hard work and education as a teacher, performer, and composer led to her success. She wrote piano music, art songs, and symphonies for singers, students, pianists, and instrumentalists. Sadly, much of her work disappeared after her death. Many publishers would not even accept her work, and she received multiple rejections before even winning the Wanamaker. Much of her information is after Samantha Egga and Ray Linda Brown began researching her and Althea Waits recording her music for the first time. Um, they wanted to introduce the world to this great American composer. And if you research her, there's really not a lot of information. It's very limited of what you can find about her. But how can we not let this happen to women of all nations, colors, and stop just being a footnote in music history? We need to say their names. We need to play their music. We can continue to play the music from the Western canon or seek these women out from our past and in our future. Their music eliminates an exciting opportunity to create greater cultural relevance and participation across all dividing lines of our society, to make teaching piano literature more diverse and inclusive at every stage of a student's musical development. So put these women on your recitals. Um, research these women and their contributions and um, to our culture as musicians. Florence Price was the first African-American composer to have her piece performed by a major orchestra. How many more of these women have we missed? Sylvia Glickman states, for any historical period, survival of music depends on publication, 
printing and recording so that it will endure and be rediscovered and circulated. Thank you. So now I will play for you Florence Price, Sonata, and E minor. <laughs> 